Hello friends, John Perry here. The other day, I was on the internet, and as one does, I was browsing the wildlife and nature photography on stevecreek.com. He has really great pictures on there. But then I came across this photograph. What on earth is going on here? What does this thing have in its mouth? Many bird species produce a structure like this. Today we're going to learn exactly what this structure is and how it is that birds evolved the ability to produce these bizarre, somewhat disturbing structures. To figure out what this structure is, we're going to look at this wonderful comic by the brilliant Rosemary Mosco. Hopefully all of you are already following Rosemary on Twitter. She's at Rosemary Mosco. She does these amazing cartoons about wildlife, about biology in general, about evolution. Really good stuff. And actually, this particular comic requires two people to read because there's like a narration piece and then there's the, the voice of the robin. Maybe it would be cool to get this robin to speak with a French Canadian accent. I'll see if I can, I'll see if I can bug my wife. Hold on. Maybe she'll come read for us. Okay, she agreed. Here we are. Springtime advice from a robin. Bask in the warm sun whenever you can. Beautiful. Find a partner who fills the air with song. Lovely words. Build a strong, cozy nest that is suitable for three to five offspring. Sweet, if specific. Consume fecal sacs after each feeding, but begin to transport fecal sacs far away from nest as the sa- Okay, I think we're done here. That's right, my friends. You heard correctly. This bird is eating a dookie. A dookie that has been entombed in a thick, durable, rubbery sack produced by the baby's body. Actually, in this case, he's probably not eating it because it's pretty big. They only eat them when they're really small. <laughs> because when babies are really, really small, baby birds, they don't digest their food very well. And so it's actually really highly nutritious. And so the mothers and the mother and the father will actually munch on it when they're low on calories. Now, some of you might be grossed out right now, but you shouldn't be. Look at how amazing this is. Look at how convenient this is. Birds come with their own automatic diapers. Here's another person you should be following on Twitter if you're not already, Sarah Winicky. <laughs> she's holding one of these fecal sacs in her hand and they are they're really solid structures it's not rubber it's mucus it's snot it's intestinal snot but it's a really thick fairly dry to the touch sort of a rubbery like substance how cool would it be if human babies did this we would never have had to invent diapers this brings us to evolutionary question number 29 how did fecal sacs evolve. At first glance, this seems like it's just a luxury item, right? Baby produces its own diaper. That's pretty cool. It's a luxury item. And luxury items don't really evolve very often, right? In order for something to evolve, you need serious selection pressures. Well, it turns out that there are serious selection pressures involved in the evolution of these sacks. Here we're looking at a robin feeding her babies. Robins have, as we learned, between two to five babies at a time. And these things hatch blind and naked. They're very, very premature when they hatch. They need very careful care. The parents have to constantly feed them, constantly clean up after them. And so these fecal sacs, they really are a matter of life and death for many species of bird. Unfortunately, I do not have footage of a robin dealing with a fecal sac, but I do have footage of the Rufus collared sparrow. Check this out. I don't know if this is a male or a female right here because they look the same, but it feeds the baby and then it goes and it grabs a fecal sac and removes it from the nest. It happens really quick. Here's another footage. This is actually different footage of the same nest. You can see it a little bit more clearly here at the end. Right there. Bam. That, that's so cool. It turns out that I am not the only person wondering how fecal sacs evolved. Scientists have also been wondering this, and they have been studying this. There's a paper about it. Evolution of Nesting Feces Removal in Avian Phylogeny. What they found is that fecal sacs seem to have evolved during an evolutionary arms race against birds and microbes, so bacteria and viruses, as shown here. And this, that's actually viruses coming out of bacteria. It's a really cool picture that I found on the 
<laughs> Wikipedia, thank you. But what these researchers found is that not all birds have fecal sacs. And the reason that not all birds have fecal sacs is because a lot of species of birds genuinely don't need them. Many species of birds, when their babies hatch, they're pretty much good to go. They're strong enough to exit the nest. They can poop outside the nest if they need to. Some of them can even hunt their own food already, right, as soon as they hatch. Most of them get a little bit of parental care at least. But a lot of them are, they're more efficient, self-sufficient than you would imagine, right out of the egg. But in order for a mother to build an egg inside of her body that is large enough to produce a baby that's ready to go as soon as it hatches, that requires a lot of work. The mother has to build a huge egg yolk, a huge egg. And while she's building that, she's extra heavy. Birds need to fly, a lot of them do. Building yolk is not easy. Yolk is the food. So you can, you can either build a huge yolk or you can feed your babies. Those are your two options, right? Birds that hatch strong, kind of ready to go out of the gate, things like chickens and ducks and so on. I mean, they're not totally ready to go right out of the gate. It takes a couple hours before a chicken will stand up and start walking around, but it's, it's only a couple of hours versus a couple of weeks sometimes for some other species. A chicken's eyes are open pretty much immediately. We call these species precocial species. And then other species of birds are what we call altricial. Altricial means that they're born extremely prematurely. They're, they hatch extremely prematurely. They're naked. They're blind. They need help from their parents. There are pros and cons to this. The, the big pro is that you can have tiny little eggs. Like this is a chicken egg compared to a pair of altricial eggs. The chicken egg is huge. Now I am cheating a little bit here in this image because the atricial eggs will actually belong to a hummingbird, but still. Altricial eggs can be really, really small, and that takes a huge burden off the mother when she's producing those eggs. This photograph, some people think it's fake, that I like photoshopped it because the chicken egg is blue, but actually some species of chicken just lay blue eggs. I was in Ecuador and I was hanging out with some friends and they gave me some eggs from their chicken. And then as I was walking away from their house, I just happened upon this hummingbird nest it was actually about waist high, and so I just bent down and, and snapped this photo. Total serendipity. I'm really glad that I finally have a legitimate reason to use this. Ecuador is amazing, by the way. You should come with me. I'll talk more about that at the end of the, of the show here. So, atricial eggs are much easier on the mother when she's making those eggs, but it means that she's going to have a lot of poop to clean up later. Thus, the evolution of the mucus around bird feces in species that hatch prematurely. If we want to understand the evolution of the structure, we first need to take a quick look at the evolution of mucus in general. Snot is far more important than you may have imagined. Mucus evolved a very, very long time ago. In fact, all animal species, almost all animal species, sea sponges don't produce mucus, but almost everything else does, including things like jellyfish and corals. They produce mucus. Mucus evolved a very very long time ago, and it is incredibly useful. Here's another comic from Rosemary Moscow, birdandmoon.com. These are just several of the ways that different animals have evolved to use mucus. You've got the queen parrotfish, which actually makes a, a net of mucus around itself before it goes to sleep, and that protects it from predators. The hagfish. Hagfish are really, really cool because if, if they get bit by a shark or something, they will immediately produce mucus at an incredible, incredible rate, so much that it will actually choke the fish that bit them. And I've, I've heard that it can actually get caught in their gills and kill them in rare cases. But normally it just, it fills their mouth and weirds them out and they, they swim away. And then you've got the, uh, the violet sea snail, which actually blows bubbles in its own snot, and then uses those bubbles to float on the top of the ocean. <laughs> It's so cool. It's useful for everything, but its main function, its original function probably, is to defend against viruses and bacteria. Here we've got a drawing, a microbial drawing by David Goodsell. He does these really cool anatomically accurate cartoons of microbes. And the green noodly structures here are mucins, glycoproteins. So it's a protein covered with sugar. Don't eat your boogers if you're on a low-carb diet, all right? Don't. Don't do it. It's protein and sugar. 
These things act as a major first-line defense against viruses. Humans have over 20 different types of mucin genes, so genes that produce mucus molecules. Some of them are transmembrane mucins, and so you got kind of like a snot layer that hangs out on the outside of a cell. So look at look at the tail down here. It goes down into the cell membrane, and so that uh, that anchors it to the cell. Others are just drifting in fluid. They're in solution. And here's what they look like under a microscope. They have this beautiful feathery structure to them, and they're slippery. <laughs> And this long feathery structure allows them to stick to each other and kind of tangle with each other. And that's what makes mucus such a neat and useful structure. You got a little, you know, mucus inside your lungs. It forms a very, very thin barrier. And it's a barrier that if it, if it rips open, it will self heal in a way, you could say, just because these things that they retangle together. It's a self healing material. And it protects your lungs against diseases. I mean, not perfectly, obviously, but pretty darn well. Mucus is also lining your intestines, and it coats the outside of your feces, just like it coats the outside of those little baby birds' feces. But of course, in humans, the mucus layer is extremely, extremely thin. Within humans, there's a ver there's variation as to how much mucus there is in your intestines. So there's variation on the thickness of the layer of mucus surrounding your feces. And the same is true amongst pretty much all animals, including birds. And this gives us a clue as to how these fecal sacs may have evolved. Darwin was really big into gradualism. He actually loosened up on his strict gradualism later on in his life, but when he first wrote his book on evolution, this is what he said. If it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Now, even though it is true that from person to person, there is a difference in the thickness of mucus in the intestines. And that gives us a start, a good start as to how this may have evolved. But there's a pretty big difference between having a thin layer of mucus versus having a solid, durable sac. And it actually does make it kind of tricky to think about how this could have evolved in a step-by-step -step manner. There are several ways it could have happened. It might be a classic example of exaptation. An exaptation is where a trait evolved for one reason, one problem, one selection pressure, and was then co-opted for a second function. I mean, it's not hard to imagine that there was some bird species somewhere that was really struggling. The only things good for it to eat in its environment were berries that were toxic and only the babies with extra mucus in their intestines were able to survive eating this toxic berry that the, the parents were feeding to it. And then you can imagine here you've got a nice, a nice place for a gradual increase in mucus because those with stronger mucus are more immune to this toxin until eventually you get full-on sac production. And once you have sac production, well, now you have a whole nother trait. This new trait is useful not just for preventing poisoning from this toxin, it's also really handy when mom and dad are trying to clean up after your mess. So that's one route that this could have taken. But actually, it turns out that in the case of mucus, <laughs> Darwin might have been being too hard on himself here. This is one of these rare cases, one of these rare adaptations that actually could have evolved in a single step. And the reason that I say that is that we know mucin genes are highly, highly evolvable. So the past few videos, I've been talking a lot about this little piece of computer tape here. This is computer tape from an old Russian computer. Data used to be stored on pieces of paper like this that computers would read, and that data was stored as holes punched in this tape. And the reason I've been talking about this so much lately is because DNA is sort of like this. Here we have a physical information storage structure. And the information that we store changes the physical properties of the storage device. The parts of data that require lots of holes for that data to be encoded, those parts make this strip of data weaker. If I were to pull on it, it's gonna break in the weakest point and the weakest point is going to be produced by the data that is embedded 
in this piece of paper? Should I do it? Should I do it? Should I pull on it and see where it breaks? Should we see which piece of data is the most vulnerable to damage? I'll tell you what. I don't want to do that because this is this is one of my coolest uh, little teaching tools. But if this video gets 100,000 views, I'll do it. I'll make a video where I break, on purpose, I break my favorite little teaching device. Okay. The reason I bring that up is because DNA is also like this. Certain sequences of nucleotides encoded information, certain sequences are weaker. They are physically weaker and they cause mutations to happen at unusually high rates. And these mucin genes, especially muc2 and muc6 in the human genome, again, we have over 20 different mucin genes, but muc2 and muc6, they are highly, highly vulnerable to mutation. They hyper mutate. They have highly repetitive nucleotide units in their sequence. And in DNA, repetitive units are super, super fragile. Some scientists speculate that this is not a fluke. This is an example of evolved evolvability. Because mucus is so important for fighting against pathogens, protecting us against viruses and bacteria, it's actually really useful if siblings have dramatically different mucus. And the reason that's useful is that if one of them gets sick and this virus or this bacteria is able to adapt to that, that individual's mucus, it won't necessarily be adapted to the sibling's mucus. That prevents a mother from losing all of her children in a pandemic. Therefore, hypermutability in mucin genes could be selected for by natural selection. Darwin may have been too hard on himself here. Granted, a fecal sac isn't really an organ, and it's certainly not a complex organ, but it is difficult to imagine the value of half a fecal sac. Unless, of course, you think it evolved through exaptation, but in this case, I think you could actually get here with a single mutation, because mutations are so common in mucin genes, and they can actually be really big mutations, large insertions and large deletions. At least a clumsy first version of it could have evolved in a single mutation. This could have evolved immediately. Once this evolved, whether it happened gradually or immediately, once it evolved, it allowed babies who were born or hatched prematurely, it allowed them to survive. Mothers that have to deal with these premature babies, well, at least they don't have to deal with all the nasty feces. It's packaged up nicely for them. They can clean up after these babies. They can do this. Once this adaptation evolved, the extremely useful adaptation of altricial eggs could also evolve. Birds could expand into much greater niches. They could conquer all sorts of new environments that were previously unconquerable. To me, this is just such a neat series of discoveries that people have made. Like, one thing evolved and led to the evolution of the other. And now we have birds in our backyards that are born prematurely and have fecal sacs. <laughs> so there you have it. The snot and turds of evolution. Make sure to check out Rosemary Moscow's stuff if you haven't already. Don't forget to, uh, you know, like and share and comment so we can get this up to 100,000 views. And before I go, I want to talk again about Ecuador. Today is April 28th. I've talked about the Ecuador tour before. In just a couple of days, the early bird special <laughs> on this year's Ecuador tour is going to be closing. So if you want to join me in Ecuador, we're going to go to the Amazon. We're going to see river dolphins, stuff you've never seen before in your life. It's going to be awesome. If you want to join me this year for a New Year's celebration in the Amazon jungle, and we're going to learn a lot about evolution, make sure you sign up now. If we only have two spots left, there is a link to the sign up website down in the video description. So long for now, my friends. Stay curious.